Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our today's session dedicated to the Indian Ocean Islands. We are proudly islanders and we will focus our today's discussion on supporting and financing climate and clean energy projects in the Indian Ocean. We are proud and honored to announce you our speakers. We will start with the presentation of Mrs. Dovina Pillay, the Financial Services Manager of the Ministry of Financial Services and Good Government uh, of the Government of Mauritius. She will be followed by Mr. Ibrahim Nizam, the CEO of the Grand Associates and former Deputy Minister of the Ministry of Environment and Energy of the Maldives. We will be followed by Mrs. Cynthia Alexander, the Principal Officer of, for Renewable Energy and Energy Management Unit of the Seychelles, followed by Mr. Thaven Naidu, the Southern Africa Regional Coordinator of PFAN, and the last but not least presenter will be Nagaraja Rao, the Head of Investment Facilitation from PFAN. Welcome to our session. I give you the floor, Dovina. Daniela, it looks like Davida is having a technical issue, so I'll ask you to go to the next speaker and hopefully she'll be able to join back soon. Okay, so if our next speaker, Cynthia Alexandra, is ready, please, you have the floor. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Okay, so. I was thinking that I was having 15 more minutes. <laughs> Let me just start sharing my screen and then I will start. Um, is it good, please? Uh, please put it into presentation mode. Oh, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, for those who are joining very, very earlier, very late, everyone. Uh, this is Cynthia Alexander, and I work as the principal officer for renewable energy and energy management at the Seychelles Energy Commission. And I'm very happy to be participating today in our uh, Island Innovation Summit to share our Seychelles case, one among the Indian Ocean Islands. So as you can see, um, we are geographically located on the Indian Ocean, but uh, far from very close to Kenya and Madagascar, we can say, but uh, very far away from all, all other places. So we are geographically isolated and very beautiful islands, and we are an archipelago of 115 islands. The socioeconomic status, uh, as you can see, we have a population of 98,000 plus people and the GDP per capita is 17,448 US dollar as per 2019. There has been a change since COVID has impacted us. Uh, the main source of income here for is from tourism sector and the fishing. And we have a high income status among Africa. So even though we have all this high income status and a very high GDP per capita, as you can see, it should be also noted that a recent study from National Bureau of Statistics and the Department of Poverty Alleviation has uh, proposed that 12% of the population of Seychelles is multidimensionally poor and experiencing deprivation related to the standard of living, education, health, and employment. This is one straightforward example to show how islands are vulnerable. Like, as you can see, since tourism is a very important uh, economic sector, the GDP is calculated based on the monetary measures. But when you go and consider non-monetary measures, you see the vulnerability of islands. So we, we are balancing each other, <coughs> sorry. We are balancing each other, but it is very important to see the impact on 
of climate change on islands because uh, it's, it's not straightforward. You cannot see it with your eyes, but it is there and we have to address each of them. And as we are talking about um, uh, focusing on climate change and as I am from the Energy Commission, I would like to give a um, portfolio of uh, what is the electrification rate in Seychelles, which is 99.54 percentage. And uh, it has to be noted that our uh, fossil fuel is imported completely imported, uh, heavy fuel oil and uh, light fuel oil. The installed capacity is 129 megawatt, where you can see 97 percentage is uh, generated from HFO and the remaining 2.3 percentage from renewable energy resources, which is mostly solar and also wind uh, farm of uh, six megawatt. But the actual generation capacity is 66 megawatt, which works every day. We also have these old generators, which will be worn out very soon. Seychelles also have national and international commitments. Uh, we have uh, uh, policy targets, energy policy targets. We have national development strategy. We have we work on the national determined contributions, and also we have a commitment to the UNFCC pledged to uh, reduction of uh, uh, absolute GHG emissions by 122.5 kilotons of carbon dioxide. But as you can see. Everything is diversified the, uh, as, as an island. We work on everything. We have to give access to electricity to the people of Seychelles. At the same time, we also have to work on other commitments. It is to be noted that energy and transport sector are contributing more for global greenhouse gas emissions also. Intensifying international focus on the challenges posed by climate change definitely has accelerated this energy transition across full spectrum of industrial sectors but the Seychelles is a country that is dependent on dependent on more on importation of uh, products like you you know right now we are working on uncertainties and changes the whole world is working on that but it is more vulnerable for island point of view and we are proud that we are part of a team that we are doing some changes we are we are doing uh, work to take action against it. We do adaptation, we do mit mitigation, and we do everything in our control that we can change. OK. Uh, secondly, uh, as uh, as islanders, we have this uh, um, uh, we have this uh, ideology that uh, we are not very much in emission when compared to bigger countries like China, America, India, or anywhere. Cynthia, but as you can see, from ask uh, that you slow down slightly, please, because we need to provide the interpretation. I'm so sorry. No I'm problem. I'm so sorry. Thank yes, you. I will. Thank you. Thank you, James. I'm so sorry. So as you can see on the first graph on the second table, it, it was taken from the fossil carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas emissions of all world countries report, which was done by emission database for global atmospheric research. We can see when, when, when we consider our um, our uh, per capita emissions instead of country emissions, we see that each one of us are contributing more irrespective of being in an island or not being in an island. So we have to be very careful about uh, what kind of uh, 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 what kind of emissions are we like? Like if you can see in the first graph, you can see the different sectors, power industry, you can see the blue color transport sector, which uses fossil fuel, and you can see buildings contributing to emissions. So everything that we do as a person, as a citizen of this earth, we are contributing for emission. It has to be understood that our small population is contributing to a higher GDP at the same time as a higher emission per capita. So what, what are the things that usually causes this in the case of Seychelles? Heavy dependence on fossil fuels. As I told you, we rely on imported fossil fuel. And you can see there is vulnerability to the global fuel price. We, we, can, uh, we can see this as a demonstrated during the COVID time last year. We, we were not sure what will happen, what will we do? When there, there was this uncertainty that we have to go through. Uh, and then there is this, uh, in order to address climate change as a vulnerability, as a small island developing state, we have to take fast decisions based on how we can adapt and mitigate towards addressing these climate change issues. And then there comes the issues of, do we have the investment cost? Do we have funding to do that? Can we budget it? So all these economical factor and social factors come into 
action when we talk about decision making due to climate change. And then there is this high cost of electricity, as you can see, since we are importing fossil fuels, definitely we have to pay a higher cost of electricity. And this, this makes the economy a bit vulnerable because, you know, uh, we don't know like what, what will happen if in case we don't import fossil fuel. So we have to be ready for that. This also affect the as economy is being affected, so is uh, social part. And as a whole, when we depend more on fossil fuels, environmentally also we are affected. So social, economic, environmental aspect is addressed only when we lead to changes shifting to renewable energy resources and energy efficient measures. In the case of Seychelles, the resources are, as I said, we have a six megawatt wind farm, but there is a seasonal wind resource, the capacity factor being only 14 percentage. And uh, we can see that only 50 percentage of the time we get more resources, the, the remaining 50 percent of the year, we don't get as much resource as we expect it to happen. And also we have very low hydro resource. We, as a tropical island, we are very much in a great uh, solar possibilities, but there is scarcity of land. We are not like sub-Saharan Africa where we have large pieces of land where we can go and try to put big solar farms. It's, it's where land is premium in Seychelles. We have to make sure what we are making out of it. But irrespective of the fact, we all we have a, a Il Romaville Island, which is a reclaimed island, fitted with uh, um, six megawatt of wind uh, solar farm along with the six megawatt wind farm present there. So what can we do to do to, to address these issues? So we need um, tailor-made knowledge and skills to, to, to participate in the future changes that we are seeing. And uh, the recent IPCC sixth assessment report has made it clear to the global scenario that how vulnerable we all are and how more vulnerable our islands are. So energy related activities are main source of emission. So addressing them will definitely help us to mitigate to some extent uh, rather than not doing anything at all, right? And um, we can see that institutional framework plays a very important role because they are the enabling environment that, that uh, allows uh, market participants, investors to play a very important role when we want to trans when we want to go through this transition because not all the time the government is uh, eligible uh, or to, to make all the changes that we expect. We, we want every, every market participants to act on it and that then it is very important to create the enabling environment that allows everyone to, 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 to participate, to bring a change and also to benefit from the changes. Seychelles have an energy policy, which uh, clearly indicates that to, need to reach a target of renewable energy penetration, 15% uh, by 2030, but uh, it gives re recommendations for energy efficiency. We are currently reviewing both the policy and the act. The Energy Act has allowed provisions for Energy Commission to be the regulator of electricity sector. And we also do the implementation of the policy, energy policy. Also, this is being reviewed so that we can have more regulations added to it. The government will product uh, the, the government's will uh, when, when, when there is a government's will and when there is a reduced political and financial risk in any islands, I think it would make a project to evolve to, to, to gain trust from the investors to go all the way until a financial closure. It is also very important when you have established mechanism that is transparency and accountability, which makes everyone feel trust towards investing also. Okay, then now I, since uh, our topic was to discuss the challenges and opportunities for such projects, I just uh, uh, pinpointed what kind of challenges we are experiencing right now and then how we can help to overcome them by using the opportunities available. So there is an incomplete legal framework and lack of regulations in the case of Seychelles, which we are working on currently. So once there is an established mechanism, it will be easy for development of renewable energy and energy efficiency project. For example, I can say independent power producers framework or ESCO energy service companies regulation so that we can have power procurement happening through the IPPs or energy auditing, energy support can be given for a, under an ESCO for a, from a private sector. So this, this adds market 
participants in the Seychelles market so that we rely on our own market rather than depending on a foreign investment or a foreign uh, consultant to provide such support for us. Financial institutions have to change their existing criteria for energy projects. Currently, we are working on uh, capacity building with financial institutions because it is very important to see these kind of energy projects in a, through a different perspective rather than seeing them as a normal infrastructure project as we see we have we used to see for a long time so it is happening but it is progressing but it is happening a, a bit slowly so there are there are uh, there are needs from islands perspective that needs to to fuel this kind of changes that is happening because right now we are in the time of action, not just uh, uh, selecting which one to go first and which one not to go first. And also there is this limited resources, as you can say, first I was explaining, there is renewable energy resources, which is uh, uh, limited in different cases. For some island, wind is more, solar is less. For different islands, it's a different case. And then when it comes to human resource personnel, there is a need for capacity building to keep developing them, their skills to address the new innovative innovations that is coming into the sector, the access to funding for both capacity building and also for using of new technologies in countries uh, in countries like Seychelles, the need of foreign expertise, it, it comes with a cost. So are we ready to take that expertise and, and develop our capacity? Do we train the trainers so that we have we have trainers. So I think knowledge sharing, sharing of uh, success and failure stories would, would be of very good help when, when, we, uh, when we want to address what kind of issues we are face, facing, which could be tailor made for our personal needs. And energy is generally cross cutting. So there is opportunity, not just in energy sector, but in all the sectors, whether you stay, you are at a residential sector, staying at home, taking care of your kids, whether you go to an office or there is tourism sector, agricultural sector, transport, or even building and construction, infrastructure development, everything uses energy. So there is always opportunities to work on different sectors. And in the case of Seychelles, there is inner islands, Pralama, and Ladi, and then there are outer islands taken care by island development company. So we can work on hybrid systems, off-grid systems with the solar integration or uh, other any uh, renewable energy integration, which can benefit the country as a whole. We are also working on exploring marine resources at the time. Currently, Seychelles is benefited by bilateral cooperation and international uh, cooperation from organizations. We have India, government of India, government of China, Abu Dhabi helping us with different projects. And also we have uh, uh, UNDP projects, uh, IRENA projects that help us uh, uh, to address the issues that we have been saying. Uh, as I was telling about enabling environment, it is very important that you have fiscal incentives in place. So. Currently, the two, there are two fiscal incentives we are working on, which is a tax exemption for products that are that, are, that uses renewable energy or energy efficiency. And then we have subsidized loan schemes for residential sector who can purchase such project products in from the market. We also were, were having a discussion to introduce green tax because to, to so that the banks are having a good support to make the, any project on energy sector to be more bankable compared to the other projects. So in general, I would say islands are limited with capacity because of their own population. And you cannot compare a big market, a sub-Saharan Africa or a bigger country's market directly to an island's market. And the size and geographical location also makes it more vulnerable. The economy of scale is low and uh, the economic vulnerability is very high in islands. Like for example, in 2020, the COVID has shown how vulnerable islands are more than the other countries because we rely on imported products. Local investors in Seychelles have to compete with foreign investors because these are new technologies. So we have to come up with the policies that says policies of inclusiveness so that as, well, as we go, as we get new projects, as we go on the, going on innovative new technologies, we also develop the capacity of the in-house people who are available. And these kind of collaborative approaches will reduce the risk and also improve the capacity locally, which is very, very important in the case of islands. So as you can see, this is my last slide. And uh, definitely by working together towards this transition series, we can work on 
reduce dependency on fossil fuel by using more renewable resources and energy efficiency. We can create more permanent jobs and develop our capacity so that we our reliance on outer people gets reduced and it makes us more secure in our own way. And we can reduce our carbon emissions by proper education and awareness. So as you all remember, uh, uh, energy can neither be created but nor be destroyed, but it can be wasted. So please be mindful. Thank you very much for listening to me. Okay, thank you, Cynthia, for this beautiful presentation. We will ask Dovina if she We will ask Dovina if she's ready for her presentation. I uh, would just like to remind everyone to please talk a little bit slowly, if possible, because we are struggling with the interpretation. You know, French is a little bit complicated. So thank you very much. The floor is yours, Dovina. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Daniela. So uh, I'm uh, Dovina from the Ministry of Financial Services and, and Good Governance. So let me just put on the slide so that we can already start the, the discussions. So actually, just to give you uh, an insight into um, what Mauritius is about. Mauritius is an island which is found in the Indian Ocean, um, actually with a population of 1.2 uh, million with an economy which is mostly based on tourism, manufacturing, and financial services. As you can already uh, understand, given that I'm mostly from the Ministry of Financial Services and Good Governance, I'll very much focus on the issues which pertain to the financial services in terms of the challenges which um, actually people face when trying to put up with and um, energy project, as well as how to address these issues. As an island, we are very much prone to climate change um, problems. And of course, there was a need to address such problem in a very effective and sustainable manner. You would also appreciate that actually fuel imports already represent more than 50% of the Mauritian import bill. And this is likely to increase given the rising cost of oil and gasoline worldwide. Over and above the impact it may also have on the current account balance, and the level of inflation, fossil fuel emit high levels of carbon, which has significant impact on the environment and health. So it was very important for Mauritius to find, I would say, sustainable uh, ways to come up with uh, energy production, especially post the COVID uh, period. Uh, the Mauritian government decided to make green energy one of another key pillar of our economy. So um, actually, we would try to focus on the challenges which are faced by project developers and entrepreneurs to develop bankable projects and reach financial closes. I would like to just share something with you. At the time uh, I was working at the bank, I very much um, remember that very often when we had uh, projects which were around, you know, green uh, energy or renewable energy, it was very difficult to assess such project because there was lots of variables which came into, into play. For instance, the lack of appropriate regulation and policies. As you know, most financial institutions, they are very much hesitant to give funding when there is no appropriate regulation because they don't know how to recover in case of any um, something goes bad. And definitely something else is, is the lack of training because people didn't know exactly how to assess such a project. So just to give you an idea of the key challenges that actually a project and promoters of a green and renewable energy projects come across are such that you have a lack of appropriate regulation and policies. There is inadequate, inadequate financing of projects and few bankable projects especially because there is no people and no skill to monitor these projects. So banks find it very difficult to understand how the project are actually progressing. There is an inadequate capability to develop and deliver the project because very often we don't know exactly how the project should look like by the end of its lifetime. There is inadequate cost recovery mechanism because if we look, for instance, um, let's say somebody is 
putting fund in a real estate um, a project, they know exactly that by the end of specific tenor, how the real estate project must actually look like. But in a renewable energy project, there are so many variables, and especially because of the time frame that is given, sometimes it can go beyond that, or there can be some overrun cost banks and fin other financial institutions are very much hesitant to, in to inject money into such projects. There is a lack of bankable of takers and especially there is also an unavailability for smaller projects and bottom of the pyramid energy access. How I would explain that is that very often you don't need big projects which are of billions and millions of rupees. Sometimes even some people in their backyard can come up with certain small projects, but still it's very difficult because there were relatively no sufficient, I would say, institutions that would agree to uh, give the funding for that. However, I must say that there has been an initiative by the African Development Bank, which was uh, done uh, three to four years ago, whereby they come up with a new deal to address these issues. The new deal actually decided to contribute that was delivering universal access by addressing seven strategic themes. These strategic themes are as follows, that is to set up the right enabling policy environment, to enable utility companies to have success in renewable energy field, to dramatically increase the number of bankable energy projects, to increase the funding pool to deliver new projects, to roll out waves of countrywide energy transformation, to accelerate major regional projects and driving integration. And of course, one of the key items is to support bottom of the pyramid energy access program. That is to give access to any lay, per any lay person, any person who has some uh, the possibility to create energy himself or herself for his own uh, consumption, but also to sell it in case there is an um, additional I would say, uh, creation of energy which was done. So these themes are the overarching initiatives that all partners have been working towards. And Mauritius has much aligned itself to these initiatives. So just to give you an idea in terms of the sustainability journey of Mauritius since 2018, actually very, uh, I would say, in, over the last past three years, we, Mauritius has had a much focus on sustainable development. In 2015, with the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which was adopted by all the United Nations member states, including Mauritius, the Universal Agenda, which comprised of the 17 sustainable SDG goals, actually uh, created that need for Mauritius to have a much bigger focus on the sustainable journey and the sustainable development. I wouldn't say that it was not done uh, earlier, it was done, but in a very dispersed manner. However, with this new commitment taken by Mauritius, there was a more cohesive approach in terms of creating a more sustainable Mauritius. In 2017 and 2018, the government of Mauritius announced its three-year strategic plan with the importance it gave to the ocean economy and also to use ocean and marine resources for sustainable development and also its commitment to achieve a cleaner, greener and safer Mauritius. In 2019, the government launched its national program, which was towered an inclusive, high-income and green Mauritius. So this actually created the vision for Mauritius to have more better policy making to ensure that there was the right framework for a sustainable uh, development. And actually in 2021, the Minister of Finance very recently announced that Mauritius intends to create the green energy industry as a new pillar of our economy. So what is very important to understand is how these initiatives have actually been done in a more tangible and a more, uh, I would say, a constructive manner. First thing was the implementation of a new sustainable financing framework. Second was giving access to funding for green projects with economic partners. 
Third was the creation of green energy industry as a new pillar of the economy. And fourth, setting up of training centers in the field of green energy. We'll go one by one so that we could elaborate a bit more in terms of what these different key actions entail for the development of sustainable, um, I would say, financing for Mauritius. Given that we've already seen the key challenges that Mauritius as a country, as an island has been facing to uh, provide, I would say, funding for green projects, we would now have a look at the different actions that have been taken to actually promote investment and project development opportunities in Mauritius. First thing was the implementation of a sustainable financing framework. This was specially done to address the regulatory aspect. Very soon after 2019, when Mauritius decided to have to step into creating a sustainable Mauritius, the government actually signed a memorandum of understanding. That is, it was done through the Ministry of Financial Services and Good Governance and the Central Chartered Bank to create a sustainable financing framework. The sustainable financing framework was to give um, the proper regulatory and legal framework for the issue of green, blue, or sustainable bond. Actually, the idea was that to provide the possibility for people, whether in Mauritius, private sector or public sector, to get access to the right funding for green projects. So soon after that, there was the setting up of a technical committee who has been working on all the projects which are eligible for sustainable financing, whether in the public sector or even the private sector, so that all these projects were actually assessed and seen whether they were eligible for issue of um, their specific bonds. In the budget of 2020, the government of Mauritius announced that the Bank of Mauritius is issuing actually a guideline which will be responsible for the creation of a framework for sovereign green bond and blue bond. A committee was set up and in February 2021, we saw the publication of this guideline which is for the green, blue, and sustainable bond. And also we included climate bonds, which were submitted for the consultation of the public and which is now already uh, enforceable. I just want to highlight something here, is that in terms of the legal uh, framework, there was no need to change anything because our current Securities Act already provides that if ever any company intends to issue bonds, they could do it and list it on the official market of, uh, the, uh, of Mauritius. However, what was not present in our framework was the way in which a green bond, a blue bond, or even a climate bond was to be monitored. Given the, the technicality of such um, a product, there was a need to have that whole framework in place, whether there would be other actors that would be required within this whole process. So this is why this uh, framework was very much important. So by coming up with this uh, new sustainable financing framework, it gave eligibility for a, large of, a larger variety of public and private issuers to have access to funding. There was a clear framework and a clear set of processes which was embedded in a document. There was a well-regulated stock exchange through the Stock Exchange of Mauritius, and it could also give access to other exchanges, I mean, internationally. It gave access to transaction advisors who were actually well-versed in the field of, uh, I would say, green bonds, blue bond, and sustainable bond, because this is very specific, and there is a need to have a list of people who could actually be, be experts in this field. And of course, it addresses the lessons which were learned from in previous countries who have gone into this field. So Mauritius has, when we decided to do it, we tried to address issues which previous countries with more experience have actually faced. So the idea was, why do we need sustainable bond? Uh, I think that I must say that although there are many 
I would say, strategic partners internationally in the like of the UN, in the like of the African Development Bank, who are proposing um, funding for specific green projects or climate change projects. The issue is there is still a funding gap. There is a need for more funds so that more projects could be initiated because climate change has impacted different countries, I mean, all through the years. And today, with this new mindset, we need to take quick actions. And this is why the quicker we take, we have the funding, the earlier we can take the remedial actions. So these bonds come more as, um, as a means to, to close the gap of funding between what is provided by international companies and what other private sectors and public sectors can actually have access to. Now, in terms of the different uh, funding access that we have in Mauritius, we have strategic partners that are providing grants and schemes. For instance, there is the Mauritius Research and Innovation Council, as well as Business Mauritius, which has teamed up to provide funding proposals for projects which are up to 5 million. So it gives the possibility for smaller and medium, I would say, um, project owners and promoters to come up with innovative ideas and submit to this institution, which would enable the protection um, of our I mean, of our environment, but also come up with new ideas of how to, uh, of new ideas and projects. Secondly, there is the UNDP, Global Environment Facility for Small Grant Program, which has uh, an amount of 24 million USD, which, was which is usually provided for 10 to 15 projects. This is decided on an annual basis. Thirdly, there is the CEB, which is the Central Electricity Board, Green Energy Company Limited. As maybe uh, most of you are aware, uh, aware, the Central Electricity Board is the governmental body which is responsible for electricity uh, dissemination in Mauritius. However, there was a subsidiary which was created specifically for green projects. So actually, they could also provide part funding, but they would spearhead because of the expertise that they have and the staff which are trained, they have the possibility of really accompanying, accompanying promoters and project owners all through the lifetime of their projects. One of the key actions that they've taken was the installation of 10,000 photovoltaic roofs on the houses of, uh, I would say, you know, lesser uh, favored people, which is like in the lowest range, so that to give them that possibility of creating their own energy. And fourthly, there was the Development Bank of Mauritius, which came up with the solar grant for also people to have access to uh, solar panels. Now, I would just like to share with you the key budget measures that were taken this year for the development of a green energy industry in Mauritius. So uh, the renewable energy industry has been actually uh, seen as a new pillar of growth. There has been several measures which were announced with the objective of increasing renewable energy contribution to a total energy of 13% to 60% integration by 2030, which has further been enhanced by the objective of totally phasing out the use of coal in Mauritius. Secondly was the implementation of the biomass framework. There has been a guaranteed price of three rupee 50 per kilowatt for bagas. This will also encourage more landowners to engage in the production of renewable energy for biomass, and at the same time, ensure a more equitable contribution of the cane industry to support small planters of sugarcane. So I just wanted to also um, align these different measures with what was, um, I would say, recommended by the um, Africa Bank of Development in their New Deal project, because there was a need to support the bottom of the pyramid energy access program. So by providing these um, possibility for small landowners, it also enabled this um, upskilling of the bottom of the pyramid people. 
Third is the greening of the transport sector. So the trans electrification of buses and car fleets currently on the road, coupled with the measures regarding can increasing- Can I ask you to wrap up, please, just so we have yeah. time for your speaker? Thank you. Sure, sure. For the increasing of renewable energy in the overall mix, there has also been a reduction of subsidies on imported buses. So just to give you an idea in terms of the different actions which were taken by the Central Electricity Board to invest around 5.3 billion over the next three years. Uh, so to raise the tenfold the absorption capacity of renewable energy. There was also the possibility of setting up a, a solar farm in Mauritius to implement the net billing project to launch different uh, requests for proposals for the setting up of a 40 megawatt a wind farm. There has been concessions on loans up to 2% for an amount of 100,000 to enable households to purchase solar kits for domestic use. And finally, there has also been a centre de formation, which is to train the people within the sector to better understand how to assess and monitor the green energy program. So these are the different actually actions which have been taken by the government to really put forward the green energy industry. I just want to um, maybe uh, to wrap up on a final idea was the need to actually have provide fiscal, um, I would say benefits when either institutions, corporations or individuals are actually investing in uh, green energy uh, projects. So the solar uh, photovoltaic projects are actually VAT exempt. There is an accelerated income tax depreciation provision for green investment, for investment in green technology equipment, which is 50% straight line. There is the utility renewable energy project are exempt from land conversion tax. Businesses and household eligible for tax deduction from investment in solar unit equipment and all interest income from debentures issued in finance renewable energy projects which are approved by the MRA are exempted of tax. So as uh, you can actually um, see from this, um, the different actions which have been taken, there is a really a commitment and a willingness to put the green energy um, as a key pillar of the industry, but also to walk the talk because the government has taken this commitment to create a sustainable Mauritius and also enable all the stakeholders and key players to have access to the right funding. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dovina, for this great presentation. We are running a bit of time, uh, so I will invite Ibrahim Nizam to present the Maldives Thank you very much. And please don't forget to introduce yourself in the chat. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Daniela. And uh, good uh, morning from the Maldives. And uh, good afternoon, good evening to those watching from different places. I'm uh, in the Maldives. I'm from the Maldives. I'm uh, uh, the, the CEO of the Grand Associates of the Maldives. Uh, it, uh, Maldives is uh, one of the small island nations in the Indian Ocean. And uh, we are uh, 568,000 people in population, about 200 islands inhabited, 162 resorts, 26 atolls, 1109, uh, about uh, 11, total in 1192 islands. And then this is 99% water and 1% land. We have, uh, Tourist facilities, 162 resorts, 11 city hotels, 160 livables, and uh, nearly 700 uh, guest houses or small island hotels. Tourism started in the Maldives in 1972, and uh, we had uh, 1.7 million tourist arrivals in 2019. And uh, 2021, until now today, we have uh, over 700,000 arrivals. We, our forecast for this year is uh, uh, 1.5 million arrivals. Uh, this year and the average occupancy throughout the year has been always uh, 70 percent tourism is the largest industry income income generating industry in the Maldives, uh, accounting for about uh, 28 percent of the gdp and more than 60 percent of Maldives foreign exchange receives uh, from the tourism industry and uh, uh, foreign investors can 100 percent on 100 percent uh, can own 100 percent uh, 
uh, their uh, foreign investments in the Maldives, and you don't need to have a local in, uh, partner in the Maldives. Uh, Maldives government does not impose any restrictions on the repatriation of your profits by a foreign exchange. And uh, uh, why invest in the Maldives? Uh, one advantage is uh, your payback period is very short. You can get your pay, uh, investment return. Uh, payback period will be about uh, five years to eight years or maximum 12 years if it is, uh, uh, if you buy an existing island because it, the cost of uh, purchasing an existing investment will be a bit higher than building a, a new island from the scratch. The major markets in two, uh, 2019 we had were Europe, China and India and uh, registering a year-on-year -year growth of 103.4% uh, uh, year-to-day in, two in 2019. Uh, these are the occupancy rates you can see on the screen now. Uh, in 2019, we had 72% uh, uh, occupancy in January, and 2019, 18, we had 74, and 2017, uh, we had 17%. Uh, uh, and uh, Maldives, uh, depends uh, a lot on uh, tourism and island tourism uh, is mostly on uh, uh, sustainable sustainable tourism and so regarding sustainability we, we have been always discussing about uh, how to make the islanders the island uh, the islanders living in the islands uh, more economically independent by uh, investing in agribusiness or or businesses uh, marine, related to marine aquaculture or seaweed, etc., and also uh, on sustainable tourism. Whereas when we talk about sustainable tourism, it is all about uh, 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 maintaining uh, sustainability by catering to the, dem the demands of the uh, sustainable traveler. If you talk about sustainable traveler, these are the foodie travelers. Foodie travelers need to have, uh, I mean, gastronomy, which is uh, mainly on uh, products uh, uh, grown within the community, within the island. For this purpose, we need the investments to invest on the agribusiness. We are talking about uh, vertical agriculture farming in the islands because uh, the land, land is small and scarcity of the land needs uh, vertical farming in the islands. And also, uh, if we have been talking about the solar energy the government is uh, uh, investing and uh, encouraging the solar energy uh, and abandoning fossil fuel and uh, by 2023 uh, the uh, the government uh, is uh, aiming to have a renewable energy share by about um, uh, 20 percent uh, mix uh, renewable energy and then by 2030 to have it uh, ramped by up uh, about 70 uh, percent and uh, these are the, uh, I mean, the sustainable tourism uh, co four components that we want to uh, uh, concentrate now and invest in the leisure traveler, the people who are traveling on business uh, to go and enjoy the leisure time at the islands, island guest houses, so island hotels. Now, the island guest houses are directly, I mean, uh, income generating activities for the islanders living in the islands. These islands, each island you have uh, about, uh, 1,000 1, or 500 people or 1,000 people, 1,000 uh, inhabitants to even 2,000 inhabitants. So they, they, are, they need sustainable tourism. They need to cater to the foodie traveler, the nomad traveler. Nomad travelers are those people who enjoy ICT, information communication technology. For this also, we need investments to increase the information technology, information communication technology within the islands, in the islands for the nomad traveler to enjoy their needs to the maximum. And then we have transformational trips I mean, these are the people who also likes to engage with the public, engage with the islanders, live in the islands and, and enjoy the, in the, the island community and the, their culture and traditions. So that is all I want to say because uh, uh, I, I mean, of time scarcity and limited time, I have shortened uh, my in, uh, I mean, presentation. Thank you and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity, James and uh, Daniela and uh, the people all from uh, PFAR, Mr. Naidu as well. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Wonderful presentation. Thank you very much, Ibrahim. 
Uh, now I'm inviting Paven Naidu from PIFAN to present uh, and to introduce PIFAN, how we work and what we do. So the floor is yours, Paven. Thank you, Daniela. And thank you everybody for the introduction to this session. Um, I, think, I think it's quite clear that there is a desperate need to support projects. And I think, you know, it's been laid out quite clearly what the challenges are. And it's interesting that these are the very challenges that PFAN is designed to address. So let me tell you a bit about what PFAN does. Yeah. I'm just gonna call up my screen. Oh, sorry. Sorry, one second. Okay, great. So, you know, I think Davina laid it out quite clearly that you know, there are a number of projects that are out there and there is also a lot of money available. There's a lot of finance available, but somehow these two sides are not, are not meeting each other. And, you know, if you look at from the project developer side, they, you know, there's a lot of projects out there, but they are not structured in a way that investors would be willing to look at them. You know, you've got great project developers with great financial, uh, with great uh, technical skills, but perhaps they lack the financial and commercial skills to, to present their projects uh, properly. And of course, you know, from our own experience, we often find that project developers have very unrealistic expectations of what they can raise and what is possible with their project. You know, from the financial side, there's a lot of money available, but you know, again, as Davina indicated, they don't often have the skills to accurately assess the risk of these projects, especially in situations where they could be in island states. And, you know, there's a lack of familiarity with the technologies and the business models. And you really need to have a substantial number of exits. You want, you want investors to see that other people, other investors have put their money into these kinds of projects and they're able to come out with some level of, 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 of increase in the, in the amount that, of money that they had put in. And this is exactly where PFAN comes in. So we try and bridge this, this missing middle. We're currently a global network, and you can see that we have a lot of uh, advisors uh, that support the work that we do. Um, we have uh, a, a, quite a big network, especially across Africa. And the SIDS now, we have two lots of SIDS. We have the Francophone SIDS in the Indian Ocean Islands uh, that fall under, under Southern Africa. And we have the, the, the Lucifone uh, SIDS in the Atlantic. <clears throat> so how does PFAN work? What we do is that we provide this coaching and investment facilitation support to, to entrepreneurs and projects at no cost to yourselves. We use professionals to provide this, this service and we provide them a fixed fee that is made possible by the people who support us in this multi-party trust fund. And you can see the names of our supporters under there. And in our work, we, we're supported by an extensive network of investment and network partners. We are currently hosted by Unido and REAP, and we've developed this business model that, that seems to be very effective. It's a very low cost and proven uh, uh, business model that works. And the way it works is that projects can apply at any time into our, into our portal. In the background, we go through the process of evaluating and selecting the projects that we want to work with. And then we, we provide this business coaching to the project. Hopefully that will get to financial flows. Generally, we provide services 
but we do also have the capacity to add a small amount of, of technical uh, assistance in terms of a tipping point fund that we have and hopefully, hopefully that will lead to financial flows through the introduction to investors. For us, gender is becoming increasingly important on all projects we try and look at gender in the multi-dimensional perspective, you know, from the ownership to management to staffing, and we look at the, the, the beneficiaries. <clears throat> so how have we done? Up to date, we've raised in excess of $2 billion for projects, that's over 150 projects. And we have a hit rate of about one in five. So while we have a very large number of projects that apply to us, of those that we actually support, about one in five uh, goes to financial close. And to date, that accounts for over a thousand megawatts of new generation and over four million tons of avoided emissions. Now, these are the metrics that we're using for mitigation. Remember, PFAN now also looks at adaptation projects. And, you know, for adaptation, of course, there, there are different metrics, but there's also a lot more sectors that, that are uh, that are applicable. A good example of uh, one of the projects they, they, that we've supported, um, it's a, a, a solar mini grid. They initially raised $5 million through PFAN and have now gone on to raise a further five. And I think they now a, a, a subsequent round of financing. Another very interesting project, um, also out of Nigeria, they use biomass to, to create these uh, to create a, a, a gel, an ethanol-based gel, and they sell that together with these stores. You can see that they initially started with 120,000 customers and have now expanded to 500,000 customers across many, many countries. And essentially, this is what we do. What we do is we make it easier for investors to look at your project. So, what does it look like when you when you join us? And you know, we, we've tried to structure this, this this session in a way that we can introduce the problem quite broadly, but then also looking in in some detail at what it is that we can do and how should you how should you structure your your, your project to be able to acquire the PIF and support and to move your project forward. So Nagaraja will go through a little bit more detail in terms of how you prepare your project. But essentially, when you work with PFAN, it's, it's a time-bound three-stage process. The first, the first stage is where we do an assessment of what your project needs. Then we appoint a, a, a professional to support you, and they help you put your documentation together in a way that an investor would be prepared to look at it. And hopefully, we can take you to meet that investor and, and, and to present your project. So it's time bound, but there's a degree of flexibility in it. So when you look at what of the what are the sectors that we're looking at, you can you can see that it's both mitigation and adaptation. And on the adaptation side, of course, agriculture, agribusiness is very important. Water is very important, you know. And there, there's a whole range of of other sectors, including tourism, that are very significant in terms of the potential to support adaptation initiatives. This is what we look at when we look at a project. For us, ideally, a project should be between a million to 50 million US dollars, but we do look at smaller projects, especially projects that have the potential for, for scale up. The project could be at any, uh, any, any level of maturity, but for us, again, an ideal project is one that has gone through its initial development and is now ready for its first round of external financing. I'm sorry if I'm rushing through this a little, but I know that we, we are uh, a little pressed for time. And I'm sorry if there's a, a bit of problem with the, with the uh, interpretation. So, you know, for any project coming in, it has to be commercially and technically viable. We look at the management team in detail. It has to have development and gender impact. And of course, the climate impact is very important for us and growth potential. And you know, I think the large number of the island states will fit into, uh, into our categories, especially those that are within the geographies that we're working in. And remember, we in the Pacific, 
we in the Indian Ocean Islands, we in the Pacific Islands, and we are also in the Caribbean. This is how we score the projects. And again, you can see that here, the, the management team uh, is looked at very significantly. And in terms of our closing date, our next closing date is the 31st of October. Of course, people can apply at any time uh, to, for their projects to be reviewed. It's just that we have these particular closing dates that allow us to, to take in these projects in, in batches. So the next closing date is the 31st of October. If you miss that deadline, it's not the, 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 the end of the world because you can still apply and you will just you will simply go into the next round of evaluation. Again, my apologies for rushing through this, but I know that we are running out of time. Thank you. Thank you, Faven, for this beautiful uh, presentation about PFAN. Uh, let's move to the next presenter, uh, speaker, who is uh, Nagaraja. Nagaraja, are you ready? Yes. Thank you. The floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon, uh, or good morning from where you are. It's my pleasure to be here with you all today. We have just heard my colleague even explaining about PFAN. And uh, it, it is my pleasure to take you through one section of what we do. Let me share my presentation with you. This is uh, visible. So why do I say, say that this is a slice of what we do, like Devon explained to you? We take a project and then look at the projects from all the stakeholders point of view. Today I will explain to you how we deal with investors presentations. This is one of the key aspects of raising finance and uh, it's important that uh, you don't waste an opportunity with an investor. It's very critical, let us say that if five investors are in, interested in your project, and if you are not careful, and let us say that if you make a mistake with one of the presenter, uh, one of the opportunities, you lose 20% of the probability of closing the deal. And there are not many investors uh, when you really go through the projects and sieve out the people who are interested only in your project and how it is possible for you to impress the shortlisted projects, uh, the shortlisted investors. As we said, PFAN encourages private sector investment. We heard our co-panelists from Seychelles, Mauritius, and Maldives, how the governments in their nation is encouraging green investment. So combined with those foundations in those uh, countries, for the opportunities that are available in the private sector, be it tourism or animal husbandry or fisheries or, uh, you know, um, uh, Mauritius is, of course, you know, all the sugar. Uh, so you have the molasses from which you have uh, ethanol, whatnot. You have all the opportunities. Solar, of course, you are all, you know, on the solar belt. So there are innumerable opportunities. So let's look at how you would pitch your project to a prospective or potential investor about your project. 
the purpose of the pitch is to stimulate interest. Now that sounds very simple, but we see many people making a mistake here because more often the entrepreneurs are so, uh, um, let's say, um, they are so involved in the project that, that very often they talk about the sales potential and not so much on the uh, interest of the investor. What we should always understand is that the investor requires an exit and therefore he's more interested in the economic benefits of the project rather than just the sales. So rem remember you're pitching to the investor and not as a technology, suppose you have a very good air conditioning technology. They are not so much interested in the technology, but interested in how the commercialization of that technology will yield returns for their investment. So you do touch upon the following milestones is achieved. I think there was a question in the Q&A saying that what type of projects we look at. We do look at projects which have been incorporated. You know, it should be a private limited company to raise money, uh, and uh, it should be looking for uh, uh, funding to grow their business. Uh, not so much on. Uh, uh, the, we don't work in the grant area at all. So it is commercial funding, either it is equity or debt. Remember, good technology is not enough. It has to have commercial value. There has to be a commercial market for that. Do not educate the investor on market. It's a waste of time. If they are talking to you, they already know the market about whether it is solar or whether it is off-grid or on-grid. If they, they, if they are ready to talk to you, they know what that is. So talk about your project. Be flexible and creative. Say a story that is interesting and relevant to your project. Believe in your plan and let be aware of limitations. There will always be certain aspects which limits your project and it is better to recognize and see how best you can present the mitigating tactics. So when you do make the presentation, be confident, be passionate about your idea and the project. It's best to get an endorsement from a customer. If you have one or two paying customers and if they endorse your project, I think that is the best reference that one can get know what the investor wants so see all projects are not something that uh, an investor would want so look at the background of the investor it is necessary to uh, classify the investor from various points like how long they are ready to invest which is the geography they are ready to invest what kind of projects they will uh, invest in what kind of returns do they want uh, what is the kind of exit that uh, I mean, the period of exit the investment that they are looking for? So these are the ways that you can sort out the investor database to see that which are the investors who are likely to be interested in your project. For example, if you are in tourism and the investor is not interested in tourism and let's say he's interested in software or it, let us say they are interested in uh, textiles, for example, then obviously, you know, there is a mismatch or let's say that you are into solar and you need a 10 year loan or a 10 year investment and they are, they can invest only for five years, then you have a mismatch there itself. So it's very important to identify the right investor before you make any pitch. Provoke investors to engage. It's always good to know something about what they are thinking and when you do engage, it's good to ask like, have you invested in similar thing or have you invested in um, uh, island uh, countries before or what is the size of the minimum size or the maximum size that you have invested. I think there was some question like that in the Q&A. Uh, we, PFAN supports projects which are about a million and we go all the way up to 50 million, but there is no hard and fast, it can be a more also. On the lowest side, if it is an impact investment like uh, uh, off-grid energy or clean cook stoves and things like that, we have done projects which are less than a million dollar also. Um, it's not necessary that you know when you make a presentation you have to go into the details because no one has the time and uh, it's always better to put in your first three or four key points to engage but it is not necessary to get it to the level of details in a 10 or 15 minutes project you will always get more time if if the project is interesting to the investor have a backup plan because you know if you talk to 10 people, it's likely that only three or four will be interested. Have a backup plan and uh, to 
manage your cash flows till you raise money, appearance, confidence, energy. It's all about body language when you make the presentation. So cover quickly, uh, you know, who you are, introduce yourself, your project, and who you are in that project. Tell the project story, how the idea was conceived, how has it developed, who are the key guys, and how it is going to change the world. Summarize the ask and use. What is that you want? This is something that people often stumble. They don't ask specifically, like let's say that I need 5 million for 10 years. I need 3 million for 4 years. I need a loan of 2 million for 3 years. Now that is something that people don't get it properly because they don't do the homework adequately. And I can tell you this with various 100% confidence because I've probably seen more than 1,000 projects in PFAN since you know we started in 2007-8. And uh, we have seen across Asia, Africa. So what we write here is something that we have experienced. And this is something that you don't, uh, you need to guard yourself when you do make the presentation. Highlight the financials and written some key aspects, you know, like uh, what would be the change in the turnover or what is the growth percentage? What is the gross profit percentage or what is the net return that you will have? What is the kind of post-tax return you are likely to get? What are the key um, ratios like return on investment or debt equity ratio? Depends on what you're asking. Risks and mitigation, everything will have a risk. So how is it that you're protecting the investor? And that's something, you know, what uh, Kevin also mentioned, we will help you here to see that, you know, your risks are identified and mitigated to the extent possible. And those that cannot be mitigated, what are the, uh, uh, what are the consequences of such uh, embedded risks, say, for example, climate risk. Uh, to some extent, it can be insured and to the extent that it cannot, how do you handle that? Reasons to invest and present the opportunity. So why it is an attractive proposition for an investor to put money in your project? So target the investor type, something that I mentioned earlier. Go to the right one. Position your project and your investment readiness. If you are still you know, at a concept level and go to the investor, you're wasting the time. If you have a business plan, if you have your financial projections, if you know what to do with the money, you have a statement of what you know, the sources of funds and application of funds, then they are interested in talking to you. Present the financial information in a focused manner. Use charts and graphs to make it attractive. Valuation is something, you know, when you are selling equity, valuation of your enterprise becomes very important. This is a uh, technical subject. And uh, when you have, if you are applying to PFAN, then, you know, your project is selected. We will allocate coaches who are located in your region and who will help you to work with this. Stress test and scenario analysis. It is always good to know how your project will behave if, let's say, the raw material price goes up by 10% or uh, the sale price comes down by 5%. What happens? Sometimes, you know, a picture paints a thousand words, like we saw beautiful pictures from all the three, uh, from, from uh, Seychelles and Maldives, I think. So, you know, it's so interesting to have that. So, if you have a project which is installed in a client space, and you take photos of that, uh, it becomes a very uh, telling uh, story about how your project is actually uh, being uh, installed and used by a client. Face the balance, so beginning, substance, and end, so that you know we have the tempo and how the story ends. Uh, there should be a logical sequence to slides. If you start, you explain your product and business model, you are, and you say how you are going to use the money and what is the returns that you will get. Avoid the data overload. Sometimes we see slides which are so overloaded with the text or pictures that it it's just not funny. Uh, people cannot really make out. You know, one on the one side you are speaking, on the other side you have got a fully loaded slide. It's not slides. Of course, is you know is just a mechanism for you to. Uh, make your presentation, and it is you don't have to write everything that you want to say. Uh, you know, when you say it is a PowerPoint presentation, we have to be sure 
that it is not a presentation where it is like uh, there is no power in the presentation. So each slide needs to be uh, evaluated as to why it finds a place in your presentation. Open and close the presentation so that it's in a manner that uh, it has a recall value. So the final tips and reminders, know your slides. See, if you know your project, if you know what you want, somewhere between 12 to 15 slides is all that you require. If you need more, you have to do your homework thoroughly. Just get it that even the best of the projects can be explained in 12 to 15 slides. And nobody is an exception. We have seen this and I can tell you that that is sufficient to convey your idea to the investor as to what you need and why you need it. And what will you do with it and how will you read it? Don't read the slides. It's always good to have the PowerPoint as a memory aid and not to read. Practice the timing. As we see quite often, probably including myself, we often step out and uh, you know we are out, out of time quite often. So it's best that we practice the timing of our presentation. It's always good to have a few minutes available. Connect to the investor. It's good if you know the investors. It's always good to have a warm introduction to the investor. Cold calls rarely work, especially in finance. Bifan can provide you that warm introduction to the investor when you see that your project is ready and that makes all the difference. Otherwise, you know, we should always remember that investors have 20 projects on their table and capital is always short, especially in developing countries. So why is it that your project will stand out and your project will gain the attention of the investor? Be yourself. That's again, you know, your confidence and your body language and how you want to uh, come across to the investor. Thank you. And all the best. Uh, back to you, Daniela. Thank you very much, Nagaraja, for this uh, great presentation. We already have some questions and comments in the chat. Uh, mm -hmm. I would like to thank especially all the people who have uh, sent messages in the chat. We have people from many parts of the world, New York, New Zealand, Doha, India, Adelaide, Ghana, Canary, Nigeria. Thank you to everyone. And those who, uh, that I have not um, noticed in my, my book, um, maybe to make sure because we are running out of time, we only have 10 minutes uh, to answer all the questions. The first question is for Cynthia. Does the session has a TDAL and waves energy production potential map and policy? This question has been asked in the chat, not in the Q&A. The second question is, uh, is for Piffen, uh, probably for Thaven, from Lisa van den uh, Heuvel. Would uh, PIFAN support a sustainably designed single family home development? The next question is for uh, Dovina. How has Mauritius addressed the financial interests of the stakeholders heavily invested in fossil fuel based energy sector? Uh, another question also. Um, to Nagaraj and Faven, does PIFAN fund projects by foreign investors for project implementation in seats, especially in the Anusian Islands? So we will try to answer to all the questions. And if we cannot have, I already asked the email address of uh, the attendees who have questions so we can follow up uh, by emails. Thank you. So, Cynthia. Thank you, Davina. <clears throat> Uh, I think I tried to answer those questions on the Q&A, but uh, I didn't see the one from the chat. Um, yes, uh, we have just started to, like, um, in, in the case of um, uh, marine resources, we have just started to do a resource assessment in the case of marine, but we see there is a huge potential we can do, especially when I was explaining in my project, uh, in my presentation, you can see there are... Um, 
inner islands and outer islands the inner islands are not very well um, located in geographically when we when we talk about the uh, really um, production scale uh, resources but we are working on to see how what kind of tidal resources what kind of wave resources could be helped we have just initiated a project in order to get resource assessment done but we are also considering outer islands to become more hybrid uh, with the uh, renewable resources and uh, diesel uh, generator that's already there where there are lots of tourism activities conservation activities um research and development are going on so hopefully we will be doing it sooner thank you however uh, just to, to add one more point uh, Seychelles is a pioneer in uh, uh, establishing blue economy and we have been working really really uh, into all kind of sectors to see how to bring economy from the blue ocean all surrounding us thank you Thank you, Cynthia. So next uh, was for um, Stephen. Me. Yes. I'm going to try and answer both questions. <laughs> um, so, you know, if you, if you understand, PFAG came out of the initial climate convention. And in that convention, it was understood that in moving technologies from the developed world to the developing world to deal with potential climate impacts, one would need some kind of financial mechanism. And that is where PFAN came in. And, you know, there is now, so we started with mitigation and we've now moved on to adaptation. And there's a lot of synergy between mitigation, adaptation, and now the SDGs. So if you understand again that we are raising private sector finance and the private sector looks for a return on their investment, so it actually is any project that is commercially viable. If, it, if it's a, 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 a developmental project where you're looking for grant funding to be able to disperse, that's, you shouldn't be coming to PFAN. You should be coming to PFAN if you have a commercial project where you believe you can make money, we can help you structure that project in a way that an investor would be more willing to look at it. And you know, the project could be anywhere from a million to 50 million, even slightly smaller if it has high replication potential. But PFAN is really there to support those projects that, de that have climate credentials. We are there to support those projects access finance. Thank you, Daniela. I can't hear you, Daniela, you're on mute. Yes, next is for Dovina. Yes, Daniela, thank you very much. I just have the question in front of me. So if I understand properly is how Mauritius addressed the financial interest of the stakeholders who have heavily invested in fossil fuel based energy sector. Actually, um, it, it's a very interesting question because the idea is you will maybe Need, have captured in the presentation when I was actually saying that Mauritius has ensured that while it was removing, let's say, for instance, the subsidies on fossil fuel uh, activities or as in the sector, it was also providing more subsidy for them to get into the, um, I would say, renewable energy sector. Let's take the example of the transport. For instance, you have initially buses were using fossil, they were using, you know, no more um, oil to run. But the issue is that once we're moving towards electrical bus, you have a higher level of subsidy for, you know, the existing, uh, I would say, people who are in the sector to have that possibility of making this transition. So the idea is we do take into uh, consideration the fact that there have been other uh, people initially who have who might have invested in this sector, but you are giving also time for them to make that shift and being able to make the move into a more renewable energy uh, field. Same thing applies, for instance, if we look at the CB, which was using heavily, CB means the Central Electricity Board, who has since, I would say, the past 10 years have made that shift into a more renewable energy field. So this is something that, of course, we cannot change overnight because there are some financial aspects which are involved for people who have invested in this field, but the government and, and other institutions are 
hand holding them to ensure that there is no loss, while at some point in time they might be uh, losing because of the sector they're in. But they can, if they intend to step into a more green sector, at least they would have a higher level of subsidy from the government. Thank you. Over to you, Daniela. Oh, th thank thank you for this uh, for your answer, Dovina. I have some problems with my, but it's okay now. Uh, welcome back, Ibrahim. We lost you a little bit <laughs> earlier. Uh, did you did you see the questions in the Q and A? Uh, I lost some questions. But then, if there was anything relevant to me, I'm. Uh, I don't see. I, I have lost questions, and after twelve, before twelve, I had no questions because my laptop was stuck. So, I uh, we want to replicate the mold in Maldives eventually in the Indian Ocean. Yeah, most of the questions <laughs> are addressed to um, Thevan and Nagaraja in the yeah. in the Q and A. Um, yes. But there is also uh, someone from the Maldives uh, who wants to replicate uh, in Maldives yeah. a project to produce hydrogen from the ocean water yeah. through renewables uh, already implemented in Europe. Hydrogen would, would then be used to power island houses and offices and marine transportation between islands. Uh, we have associated the very companies who have implemented that project in Europe, but we need to finance a feasibility study that the company's expert would carry in Maldives. Any of the speakers could tell us which public or private sector entities could provide the funds for the, for the feasibility study. Uh, Daniela, can I add comments? something to it? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, in, uh, in Maldives now we have uh, uh, one, uh, I, I, we have identified um, uh, islands uh, very appropriate for these uh, ocean currents, you know, uh, generating power from the ocean current. So uh, this is a very relevant. I'm sure there are the possibility of uh, exploring that uh, opportunity also. I mean, uh, uh, um, generate from the ocean. Uh, in Maldives, we have solar energy and then uh, Many resources, also there is at, hundred, at least one resource that is 100% reliable on solar energy. And uh, many resources are adopting this uh, near solar energy because uh, it reduces at least 30% of the uh, energy that they are consuming on the fossil fuel. And the government is uh, aiming to have 20% uh, share by 2023 and then by 70% by 2030. This is a huge, I mean, uh, I mean, a very good, uh, I mean, initiative by the government. And uh, the fossil fuel, I mean, uh, solar energy, you know, many people are adopting uh, solar energy even for the local islanders and uh, in uh, many parts of the country. So well, this is, I think, one area, the ocean current is one area that we could concentrate on. If, we, if somebody could answer that one, yeah, about financing. Uh, will be nice. It will be very really good. Yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you, uh, Ibrahim. Um, can uh, Nagaraja or Faven answer directly in the Q and A, or do you want to to bring the answers directly here? A quick question about whether we're going to go into the booth and people can attend the booth to ask further question. But on the questions that exist, essentially, PFAN will look at any sector that has climate credentials. We look at projects between a million to 50 million, and our services are provided free. But, you know, they're provided by professionals that we pay a minimal amount to, and we leave the possibility of a success fee negotiation for the professional to conduct with the project developer when you get to financial close. But prior to that, everything that we do is provided free to the, to the project. Uh, just to 
if I may add to, to what uh, Devin said, the professional services would help you in putting up a quality business plan for your project. It will also help you in uh, your financial projections, uh, validation of all your um, assumptions and uh, expectations of the investors from similar projects. So this would reduct and reduction of or identification and mitigation of risks, project risks. So these are the things that can come to you. Uh, with, this is basically from the donor support uh, passed on to the end uh, project uh, developers. And there onwards, it, it is an agreement between you and the project developer as Kevin just explained. I think there is another question where I think it said whether we have a branch in Madagascar, I think you should talk to Daniela. She's the country coordinator for Madagascar. Uh, back to you, Daniela. Okay, so I think we have uh, almost all the questions answered. Uh, someone is asking for the link uh, to submit projects in the chat, the direct link to submit the projects. So, um, I've just noted all the email address. Maybe last one last question. They ask if it is possible to share the copies of the presentations of each of the presentations. It depends on the speaker, I think. So if you are okay that uh, I share the, your, uh, your presentation to, to some of the attendees who send their email address and uh, I can do, I can do it. Uh, also someone asked, one of the recordings will also be available uh, on the Island Innovation site. So you will be able to access the entire presentation. So I think that's all. Corinne Dubois asked the question to all the speakers, as the first resource of that island is the sea, do you have a radio mapping for tidal energy and waves energy resources? And how do you integrate the possible related valuable potential into the electricity mix? These energies can be modest enough for the seaport infrastructure and efficient enough depending on the local resource. Maybe Cynthia has, a, has an answer. Um. Thank you, Daniela. Uh, for, for, for the Seychelles case, I would say marine spatial mapping has been done for Seychelles, uh, especially con concentrating on uh, conservation, sea turtle, turtle nesting, and uh, tourism related activities. But it is an ongoing session where we will see how to address all the other pillars of blue economy into this sector. But as I said, we have just initiated on, um, <clears throat> on uh, resource assessment and mapping of the resources for energy purposes. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Anyone who has any more comments? Hi, everyone. I'm going to have to ask you to wrap up the session now. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. And we hope to see you in the date working interactive discussion. Thank you for to all the speakers. You were very brilliant and to all the attendees who have participated, mainly in the chat. Thank you, thank Daniela. You, thank you, all thank the you Daniela. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, thank you, thank you all the attendees. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, you. thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you Daniela. Bye. Bye. Just one, one last capture for us to add a picture, please. Do you mind? Go for it. Please. Please turn your camera on. Now I can see someone's missing. Cynthia? Cynthia's left. Um, uh, oh, okay. You can take a capture. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Have a great day. Bye.